Section 11 of The Oxford Book of American Essays Chosen by Brander Matthews This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 11 As soon as the Massachusetts Regiment had made prize of the ferry boat, a call was made for engineers to run her. Some twenty men at once stepped to the front. We of the New York 7th afterwards concluded that whatever was needed in the way of skill or handicraft could be found among those brother Yankees. They were the men to make armies of. They could tailor for themselves, shoe themselves, do their own blacksmithing, gunsmithing, and all other work that calls for sturdy arms and nimble fingers. In fact, I have such profound confidence in the universal accomplishment of the Massachusetts 8th that I have no doubt if the order were poets to the front, painters present arms, sculptors charge bayonets, a baker's dozen out of every company would respond. Well, to go on with their story, when they had taken their prize, they drove her straight downstream to Annapolis, the nearest point to Washington. There they found the Naval Academy in danger of attack and old ironsides, serving as a practice ship for the future midshipmen also exposed. The call was now for seamen to man the old craft and save her from a worse enemy than her prototype met in the guerriere. Seamen? Of course. They were marble-headed men, Gloucester men, Beverly men, seamen all par excellence. They clapped on the frigate to aid the middies and by and by started her out into the stream. In doing this, their own pilot took the chance to run them purposely on a shoal in the intricate channel. A great error of judgment on his part, as he perceived, when he found himself in irons and in confinement. The days of trifling with traitors are over, think the Eighth Regiment of Massachusetts. But there they were, hard and fast, on the shoal, when we came up nothing to nibble on but knobs of anthracite, nothing to sleep on softer or cleaner than coal dust, nothing to drink but the brackish water under their keel, rather rough, so they afterward patiently told us. Meantime the Constitution had got hold of a tug and was making her way to an anchorage where her guns commanded everything and everybody. Good and Two men chuckled greatly over this. The stars and stripes also were still up at the fort at the Naval Academy. Our dread that, while we were off at sea, some great and perhaps fatal harm had been suffered was greatly lightened by these good omens. If Annapolis was safe, why not Washington safe also? If treachery had got head at the capital, would not treachery have reached out its hand and snatched this doorway? These were our speculations as we began to discern objects before we heard news. But news came presently. Boats pulled off to us. Our officers were put into communication with the shore. The scanty facts of our position became known from man to man. We privates have greatly the advantage in battling with the doubt of such a time. We know that we have nothing to do with rumors. Orders are what we go by, and orders are facts. We lay a long, lingering day off Annapolis. The air was full of doubt, and we were eager to be let loose. All this while the Maryland struck fast on the bar. We could see them half a mile off, making every effort to lighten her. The soldiers tramped forward and aft, danced on her decks, shot overboard a heavy baggage truck. We saw them start the truck for the stern with a cheer. It crashed down, one end stuck in the mud. The other fell back and rested on the boat. They went at it with axes, and presently it was clear. As the tide rose, we gave our grounded friends a lift with the hawser. No go. The Boston tugged in vain. We got near enough to see the whites of the Massachusetts eyes 
and their unlucky faces and uniforms all grimy with their lodgings in the coal dust they could not have been blacker if they had been breathing battle smoke and dust all day that experience was clear gain to them by and by greatly to the delight of the impatient seventh the boston was headed for sure never speak ill of the beast you bestraddle therefore requiescat boston may her ribs lie light on soft sand when she goes to pieces may her engines be cut up into bracelets for the arms of the patriotic fair good-bye to her dear old close dirty slow coach she served her country well in a moment of trial who knows but she saved it it was a race to see who should first get to washington and we and the virginia mob in alliance with the district mob were perhaps nip and tuck for the goal annapolis so the seventh regiment landed and took annapolis we were the first troops ashore the middies of the naval academy no doubt believed that they had their quarters secure the massachusetts boys are satisfied that they first took the town in charge and so they did but the seventh took it a little more not of course from its loyal men but for its loyal men for loyal maryland and for the union has anybody seen annapolis it is a picturesque old place sleepy enough and astonished to find itself wide awaked by a war and obliged to take responsibility and share for good and ill in the movement of its time the buildings of the naval academy stand parallel with the river severn with a green plateau toward the water and a lovely green lawn toward the town all the scene was fresh and fair with april and i fancied as the boston touched the wharf that i discerned the sweet fragrance of apple blossoms coming with the springtime airs i hope that the companies of the seventh should the day arrive will charge upon horrid batteries or serried ranks with as much alacrity as they marched ashore on the greensward of the naval academy we disembarked and were halted in line between the buildings and the river presently while we stood at ease people began to arrive some with smallish fruit to sell some with smaller news to give nobody knew whether washington was taken nobody knew whether jeff davis was now spitting in the presidential spittoon and scribbling his distiches with the nib of the presidential goose quill we were absolutely in doubt whether a seemingly inoffensive knot of rustics on a mound without the enclosures might not at tap of drum unmask a battery of giant columbiads and belch blazes at us raking our line nothing so entertaining happened it was a parade not a battle at sunset our band played strains sweet enough to pacify all secession if secession had music in its soul coffee hot from the coppers of the naval school and biscuit were served out to us and while we supped we talked with our visitors such as were allowed to approach first the boys of the school fine little blue jackets had their story to tell do you see that white farmhouse across the river says a brave pygmy of a chap in navy uniform that is headquarters for secession they are going to take the school from us sir and the frigate but we've got ahead of em now you and the massachusetts boys have come down and he twinkled all over with delight we can't study any more we are on guard all the time we've got howitzers too and we'd like you to see to-morrow on drill how we handle em one of their boats came by our sentry last night a sentry probably five feet high and he blazed away sir so they thought they wouldn't try us that time it was plain that these young souls had been well tried by the treachery about them they too had felt the pang of the disloyalty of comrades nearly a hundred of the boys had been spoiled by the base example of their elders in repudiating states and had resigned 
after the middies came anxious citizens from the town scared all of them now that we were come and assured them that persons and property were to be protected they ventured to speak of the disgusting tyranny to which they american citizens had been subjected we came into contact here with utter social anarchy no man unless he was ready to risk assault loss of property exile dared to act or talk like a freeman this great wrong must be righted think the seventh regiment as one man so we tried to reassure the annapolitans that we meant to do our duty as the nation's armed police and mob law was to be put down so far as we could do it here too voices of war met us the country was stirred up if the rural population did not give us a bastard imitation of lexington and concord as we tried to gain washington all plug uglydom would treat us a la plug ugly somewhere near the junction of the annapolis and baltimore and washington railroad the seventh must be ready to shoot at dusk we were marched up to the academy and quartered about in the buildings some in the fort some in the recitation halls we lay down on our blankets and knapsacks up to this time our sleep and diet had been severely scanty we stayed all next day at annapolis the boston brought the massachusetts eighth ashore that night poor fellows what a figure they cut when we found them bivouacked on the academy grounds next morning to begin they had come off in hot patriotic haste half uniformed and half outfitted finding that baltimore had been taken by its own loafers and traders and that the chesapeake ferry was impracticable had obliged them to change line of march they were out of grub they were parched dry for want of water on the ferry boat nobody could decipher caucasian much less bunker hill yankee in their grimy visages but hungry thirsty grimy these fellows were grit massachusetts ought to be proud of such hardy cheerful faithful sons we of the seventh are proud for our part that it was our privilege to share our rations with them and to begin a fraternization which grows closer every day and will be historical but i must make a shorter story we drilled and were reviewed that morning on the academy parade in the afternoon the naval school paraded their last before they gave up their barracks to the coming soldiery so ended the twenty third of april midnight twenty fourth we were rattled up by an alarm perhaps a sham one to keep us awake and lively in a moment the whole regiment was in order of battle and the moonlight on the parade it was a most brilliant spectacle as company after company rushed forward with rifles glittering to take their places in the array after this pretty spirit we were rationed with pork beef and bread for three days and ordered to be ready to march on the instant what the massachusetts eighth had been doing meantime general butler's command the massachusetts eighth had been busy knocking disorder in the head presently after their landing and before they were refreshed they pushed companies out to occupy the railroad track beyond the town they found it torn up no doubt the scamps who did the shabby job fancied that there would be no more travel that way until strawberry time they fancied the yankees would sit down on the fences and begin to whittle white oak toothpicks darning the rebels through their noses meanwhile i know these men of the eighth can whittle and i presume they can say darn it if occasion requires but just now track laying was the business at hand wanted experienced track layers was the word along the files all at once the line of the road became densely populated with experienced track layers fresh from massachusetts presto change the rails were relayed spiked 
and the roadway leveled and better ballasted than any road I ever saw south of Mason and Dixon's line. We must leave a good job for these folks to model after, say, the Massachusetts 8th. A track without a train is as useless as a gun without a man. Train and engine must be had. Uncle Sam's mails and troops cannot be stopped. Another minute, our energetic friends conclude. So, the railroad company's people being either frightened or false, in marshes, Massachusetts to the station, we the people of the United States want rolling stock for the use of the Union, they said, or words to that effect. The engine, a frowsy machine, at the best, had been purposely disabled. Here appeared the deus ex machina, Charles Homans, Beverly Light Guard, Company E, 8th Massachusetts Regiment. That is the man, name and titles in full, and he deserves well of his country. He took a quiet squint at the engine. It was as helpless as a boned turkey, and he found Charles Homans, his mark, written all over it. The old rattletrap was an old friend. Charles Homans had had a share in building it. The machine of the man said, How do you do, at once? Homans called for a gang of engine builders. Of course, they swarmed out of the ranks. They passed their hands over the locomotive a few times, and presently it was ready to whistle and wheeze and rumble and gallop as if no traitor had ever tried to steal the go and the music out of it. This had all been done during the afternoon of the 23rd. During the night, the renovated engine was kept cruising up and down the track to see all clear. Guards of the 8th were also posted to protect passage. Our commander had, I presume, been cooperating with General Butler in this business. The Naval Academy authorities had given us every dispatch and assistance, and the middies frank personal hospitality. The day was halcyon, the grass was green and soft, the apple trees were just in blossom. It was a day to be remembered. Many of us will remember it, and show the marks of it for months, as the day we had our heads cropped. By evening there was hardly one pole in the seventh, tenable by anybody's grip. Most sat in the shade, and were shorn by a barber. A few were honoured with a clip by the artist hand of the petit corporal of our engine company. While I rattle off these trifling details, let me not fail to call attention to the grave service done by our regiment by its arrival at the neck of time at Annapolis. No clearer special providence could have happened. The country people of the traitor sort were aroused. Baltimore and its mob were but two hours away. The Constitution had been hauled out of reach of a rush by the Massachusetts men, first on the ground, but was half manned and not fully secure. And there lay the Maryland, helpless on the shoal, with six or seven hundred souls on board, so near the shore that the late Captain Rinder's gun could have sunk her from some ambush. Yes, the Seventh Regiment at Annapolis was the right man in the right place. Our morning march. Reville, as nobody pronounces this word à la française, as everybody calls it reveille, why not drop it as an affectation and translate it the stir your stumps, the peel your eyes, the tumble up, or literally the wake? Our snorers had kept up this call so lustily since midnight that, when the drums sounded it, we were all ready. The sixth and second companies under Captain Nevers are detached to lead the van. I see my brother Billy march off with the sixth into the dusk, half moonlight, half dawn, and hope that no beggar of a secessionist will get a pat shot at him by the roadside without his getting a chance to let fly in return. Such little possibilities intensify the earnest detestation we feel for the treasons we come to resist and to punish. There will be some bitter work done if 
we ever get to blows in this war, this needless, reckless, brutal assault upon the mildest of all governments. Before the main body of the regiment marches, we learn that the Baltic and other transports came in last night with troops from New York and New England, enough to hold Annapolis against a square league of pug uglies. We do not go on without having our rear protected and our communications open. It is strange to be compelled to think of these things in peaceful America, but we really knew little more of the country before us than Cortez knew of Mexico. I have since learned from a high official that thirteen different messengers were dispatched from Washington in the interval of anxiety, while the seventh was not forthcoming, and only one got through. At half-past seven we took up our line of march, passed out of the charming grounds of the academy, and moved through the quiet, rusty, picturesque old town. It has a romantic dullness, Annapolis, which deserves a parting compliment. Although we deem ourselves a fine-looking set, although our belts are blanched with pipe clay and our rifles shine sharp in the sun yet the townspeople stare at us in a dismal silence they have already the air of men quelled by a despotism none can trust his neighbor if he dares to be loyal he must take his life into his hands most would be loyal if they dared but the system of society which has ended in this present chaos has gradually eliminated the bravest and best men they have gone in search of freedom and prosperity and now the bullies cow the weaker brothers there must be an end of this mean tyranny think the seventh as they march through old annapolis and see how sick the town is with doubt and alarm outside the town we strike the railroad and move along the howitzers in front bouncing over the sleepers when our line is fully disengaged from the town we halt here the scene is beautiful the van rests upon a high embankment with a pool surrounded by pine trees on the right green fields on the left cattle are feeding quietly about the air sings with birds the chestnut leaves sparkle frogs whistle in the warm spring morning the regiment groups itself along the bank and the cutting several Marylanders of the half-price age under twelve come gaping up to see us harmless invaders each of these young gentry is armed with a dead spring frog perhaps by way of tribute and here hello here comes horace greeley in propria persona he marches through our groups with the greeley walk the greeley hat on the back of his head greeley white coat on his shoulders his trousers much too short and an absorbed abstracted demeanour can it be horace reporting for himself no this is a maryland production and a little disposed to be sulky after a few minutes halt we hear the whistle of the engine this machine is also an historic character in the war remember it j h nicholson is its name charles holmes drives and on either side stands a sentry with fixed bayonet new spectacles for america but it is grand to know that the bayonets are to protect not to assail liberty and law the train leads off we follow by the track presently the train returns we pass it and trudge on in light marching order carrying arms blankets haversacks and canteens our knapsacks are upon the train fortunate for our backs that they do not have to bear any more burden for the day grows sultry it is one of those breezeless baking days which brew thunder gusts we march for some four miles when coming upon the guards of the massachusetts eighth our howitzer is ordered to fall out and wait for the train with a comrade of the artillery i am placed on guard over it on guard with howitzer number two henry bonnell is my fellow sentry he like myself is an old campaigner in such campaigns as our generation has known so we talk california 
Oregon, Indian life, the plains, keeping our eyes peeled, meanwhile, and ranging the country. Men that will tear up track are quite capable of picking off a sentry. A giant chestnut gives us little dots of shade from its pygmy leaves. The country about us is open and newly ploughed. Some of the worm fences are new and ten rails high, but the farming is careless and the soil thin. Two of the Massachusetts men come back to the gun while we are standing there. One is my friend Stephen Morris of Marblehead, Sutton Light Infantry. I had shared my breakfast yesterday with Steffi. So we fraternized. His business is, I make shoes in winter and fishing in summer. He gives me a few facts. Suspicious persons seen about the track, men on horseback in the distance. One of the Massachusetts guard last night challenged his captain. Captain replied, Officer of the night. Whereupon, says Steffi, the recruit let squizzle and just missed his ear. He then related to me the incident of the railroad station. The first thing they knowed, said he, we bit right into the depot and took charge. I don't mind, Steffi remarked, I don't mind life, nor yet death, but whenever I see a Massachusetts boy, I stick by him, and if them secessionists attacked us tonight, or any other time, they'll get in debt. Whistle again, and the train appears. We are ordered to ship our howitzer on a platform car. The engine pushes us on. The train brings our light baggage and the rear guard. A hundred yards farther on is a delicious fresh spring below the bank. While the train halts, Steffi Morris rushes down to fill my canteen. This ain't like Marblehead, says Steffi, panting up, but a man that can shin up them rocks can get right over this sand. The train goes slowly on as a rickety train should. At intervals we see the fresh spots of track just laid by our Yankee friends. Near the sixth mile we began to overtake hot and uncomfortable squads of our fellows. The unseasonable heat of this most breathless day was too much for many of the younger men unaccustomed to rough work and weakened by want of sleep and irregular food in our hurried movements thus far charles holman's private carriage was however ready to pick up tired men hot men thirsty men men with corns or men with blisters they tumbled into the train in considerable numbers an enemy that dared could have made a moderate bag of stragglers at this time but they would not have been allowed to straggle if any enemy had been about by this time we were convinced that no attack was to be expected in this part of the way the main body of the regiment under major shaler a tall soldierly fellow with a moustache of the fighting colour tramped on their own pins to the watering place eight miles or so from annapolis their troops and train came to a halt with the news that a bridge over a country road was broken a mile farther on it had been distinctly insisted upon in the usual southern style that we were not to be allowed to pass through maryland and that we were to be welcomed to hospitable graves the broken bridge was a capital spot for a skirmish why not look for it here we looked but got nothing the rascals could skulk about by night tear up rails and hide them where they might be found by a man with half an eye or half destroy a bridge but there was no shoot in them they have not faith enough in their cause to risk their lives for it even behind a tree or from one of those thickets choice spots for ambush so we had no battle there but a battle of the elements the volcanic heat of the morning was followed by a furious storm of wind and a smart shower the regiment wrapped themselves in their blankets and took their wetting with more or less satisfaction they were receiving samples of all the different little miseries of a campaign and here let me say a word to my fellow volunteers actual and prospective in all the armies of all the states a soldier needs, besides his soldierly drill, one good feat, 
two, a good stomach, three, and after these come the good head and the good heart. But good feet are distinctly the first thing. Without them you cannot get to your duty. If a comrade or a horse or a locomotive takes you on its back to the field, you are useless there, and when the field is lost you cannot retire, run away, and save your bacon. Good shoes and plenty of walking make good feet. A man who pretends to belong to an infantry company ought always to keep himself in training, so that any moment he can march twenty or thirty miles without feeling a pang or raising a blister. Was this the case with even a decimation of the army who rushed to defend Washington? Were you so trained, my comrades of the Seventh? A captain of a company who will let his men march with such shoes as I have seen on the feet of some poor fellows in this war ought to be garroted with shoestrings, or at least compelled to play pope and wash the feet of the whole army of the apostles of liberty. If you find a foot soldier lying beat out by the roadside, desperate as a seasick man, five to one his heels are too high, or his soles too narrow or too thin, or his shoe is not made straight on the inside, so the great toe can spread into its place as he treads. I am an old walker over Alps across the water, and over Cordillaras, Sierras, deserts, and prairies at home. I have done my near sixty miles a day without discomfort, and speaking from large experience, and with painful recollection of the suffering and death I have known for want of good feet on the march, I say to every volunteer, trust in God, but keep your shoes easy. The bridge. When the frenzy of the brief tempest was over, it began to be a question what to do about the broken bridge. The gap was narrow, but even Charles Homans could not promise to leap the J. H. Nicholson over it, who was to be our Julius Caesar in bridge-building, who but Sergeant Scott, armorer of the regiment, with my fellow sentry of the morning, Bonnell, as first assistant. Scott called for a working party. There were plenty of handy fellows among our engineers and in the line. Tools were plenty in the engineer's chest. We pushed the platform car upon which howitzer number one was mounted down to the gap and began operations. I wish, says the petite corporal of the engineer company, patting his howitzer gently on the back, that I could get this putty blower pointed at the enemy while you fellows are bridge building. The inefficient destructives of Maryland had only half spoiled the bridge. Some of the old timbers could be used, and for new ones there was the forest. Scott and his party made a good and a quick job of it. Our friends of the Massachusetts Eighth had now come up. They lent a ready hand, as usual. The sun set brilliantly. By twilight there was a practicable bridge. The engine was dispatched back to keep the road open. The two platform cars, freighted with our howitzers, were rigged with gun ropes for dragging along the rail. We passed through the files of the Massachusetts men resting by the way, and eating by the fires of the evening the suppers we had in great part provided them. And so begins our night march. The night march. O oh, Gottschalk! What a poetic march de nuit! We then began to play with our heels and toes on the railroad track. It was full moonlight and the night inexpressibly sweet and serene. The air was cool and vivified by the gust and shower of the afternoon. Fresh spring was in every breath. Our fellows had forgotten that this morning they were hot and disgusted. Every one hugged his rifle as if it were the arm of the girl of his heart and stepped out gaily for the promenade. Tired or footsore men or even lazy ones could mount upon the two freight cars we were using for artillery wagons. There were stout arms enough to tow the whole. The scouts went ahead under First Lieutenant Farnham of the Second Company. 
We were at school together. I am afraid to say how many years ago. He is just the same cool, dry, shrewd fellow he was as a boy, and a most efficient officer. It was an original kind of march. I suppose a battery of howitzers never before found itself mounted upon cars, ready to open fire at once and bang away into the offing with shrapnel or into the bushes with canister. Our line extended a half a mile along the track. It was beautiful to stand on the bank above a cutting and watch the files strike from the shadow of a wood into a broad flame of moonlight every rifle sparkling up alert as it came forward a beautiful sight to see the barrels writing themselves upon the dimness each a silver flash by and by halt came repeated along from the front company after company halt a rail gone it was found without difficulty the imbeciles who took it up probably supposed it would not wish to wet our feet by searching for it in the dewy grass of the next field with incredible doltishness they had also left the chairs and spikes beside the track bonnell took hold and in a few minutes had the rail in place and firm enough to pass the engine remember we were not only hurrying on to succor washington but opening the only convenient and practicable route between it and the loyal states a little farther on we came to a village a rare sight in this scantily peopled region here sergeant keeler of our company the tallest man in the regiment and one of the handiest suggested that we should tear up the rails at a turnout by the station and so be prepared for chances so out crowbars was the word we tore up and bagged half a dozen rails with chairs and spikes complete here too some of the engineers found a keg of spikes this was also bagged and loaded on our cars we fought the chaps with their own weapons since they would not meet us with ours these things made delay and by and by there was a long halt while the colonel communicated by orders sounded along the line with the engine homan's drag was hard after us bringing our knapsacks and traps after i had admired for some time the beauty of our moonlit line and listened to the orders as they grew or died along the distance i began to want excitement bonnell suggested that he and i should scout up the road and see if any rails were wanting we traveled along into the quiet night a mile ahead of the line we suddenly caught the gleam of a rifle barrel who goes there one of our own scouts challenged smartly we had arrived at the nick of time three rails were up two of them were easily found the third was discovered by beating the bush thoroughly bonnell and i ran back for tools and returned at full trot with crowbar and sledge on our shoulders there were plenty of willing hands to help too many indeed and with the aid of a huge massachusetts man we soon had the rail in place from this time on we were constantly interrupted not a half mile passed without a rail up bonnell was always at the front laying track and i am proud to say that he accepted me as aide de camp other fellows unknown to me in the dark gave hearty help the seventh showed that it could do something else than drill at one spot on a high embankment over standing water the rail was gone sunk probably here we tried our rails brought from the turnout they were too short we supplemented with a length of plank from our stores we rolled our cars carefully over they passed safe but holman shook his head he could not venture a locomotive on that frail stuff so we lost the society of the j h nicholson next day the massachusetts commander called for someone to dive in the pool for the lost rail plump into the water went a little wiry chap and grappled the rail when i come up says the brave fellow afterwards to me our 
officer out with a twenty-dollar gold piece and wanted me to take it. That ain't what I come for, says I. Take it, says he, and share with the others. That ain't what they come for, says I. But I took a big cold, the diver continued, and I'm condemned horse yet. Which was the fact. Farther on we found a whole length of track torn up on both sides, sleepers and all and the same thing repeated with alterations of brakes of single rails. Our howitzers came into play to hoist and haul. We were not going to be stopped. But it was becoming a knock triste to some of our comrades. We had now marched some sixteen miles. The distance was trifling, but the men had been on their legs pretty much all day and night. Hardly anyone had had any full or substantial sleep, or meal since we started from New York. They napped off, standing, leaning on their guns, dropping down in their tracks on the wet ground at every halt. They were sleepy but plucky. As we passed through deep cuttings, places, as it were, built for defense, there was a general desire that the tedium of the night should be relieved by a shindy. During the whole night I saw our officers moving about the line, doing their duty vigorously despite exhaustion, hunger, and sleeplessness. About midnight our friends of the 8th had joined us, and our whole little army struggled on together. I find that I have been rather understating the troubles of the march. It seems impossible that such difficulty could be encountered within twenty miles of the capital of our nation, but we were making a rush to put ourselves in that capital, and we could not proceed in the slow, systematic way of an advancing army. We must take the risk and stand the suffering, whatever it was. So the Seventh Regiment went through its bloodless knock triste. Morning. At last we issued from the damp woods two miles below the railroad junction. Here was an extensive farm, our vanguard, had halted and borrowed a few rails to make fires. These were, of course, carefully paid for at their proprietor's own price. The fires were bright in the gray dawn. About them the whole regiment was now halted. The men tumbled down to catch forty winks. Some, who were hungrier for food than sleep, went off foraging among the farmhouses. They returned with appetizing legends of hot breakfast, inhospitable abodes, or scanty fare, given grudgingly in hostile ones. All meals, however, were paid for. Here, as at other halts below, the country people came up to talk to us. The traitors could easily be distinguished by their insolence, disguised as obsequiousness, the loyal men were still timid, but more hopeful at last. All were very lavish with the monosyllable sir. It was an odd coincidence that the vanguard, halting off at a farm in the morning, found it deserted for the moment by its tenants, and protected only by an engraved portrait of our former Colonel Durier, serenely smiling over the mantelpiece. From this point the railroad was pretty much all gone, but we were warmed and refreshed by a nap and a bite, and besides had daylight and open country. We put our guns on their own wheels, all dropped into ranks as if on parade, and marched the last two miles to the station. We still had no certain information, until we actually saw the train awaiting us and the Washington companies who had come down to escort us drawn up. We did not know whether our Uncle Sam was still a resident of the capital. We packed into the train and rolled away to Washington. Washington. We marched up to the White House, showed ourselves to the President, made our bow to him as our host, and then marched up to the capital, our grand lodgings. There we are now, quartered in the representative's chamber, and here I must hastily end this first sketch of the great defense. May it continue to be as firm and faithful as it is this day. 
I have scribbled my story with a thousand men stirring about me. If any of my sentences miss their aim, accuse my comrades. And the bewilderment of this martial crowd, for here are four or five thousand others on the same business as ourselves, and drums are beating, guns are clanking, companies are tramping all the while. Our friends of the 8th Massachusetts are quartered under the dome and cheer us whenever we pass. Desks marked John Cavode, John Cochran, and Anson Burlingame have allowed me to use them as I wrote. Calvin, A Study of Character by Charles Dudley Warner Calvin is dead. His life, long to him, but short for the rest of us, was not marked by startling adventures, but his character was so uncommon and his qualities were so worthy of imitation that I have been asked by those who personally knew him to set down my recollections of his career. His origin and ancestry were shrouded in mystery. Even his age was a matter of pure conjecture. Although he was of the Maltese race, I have reason to suppose that he was American by birth, as he certainly was in sympathy. Calvin was given to me eight years ago by Mrs. Stowe, but she knew nothing of his age or origin. He walked into her house one day out of the great unknown, and became at once at home as if he had been always a friend of the family. He appeared to have artistic and literary tastes, and it was as if he had inquired at the door if that was the residence of the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and upon being assured that it was, had decided to dwell there. This is, of course, fanciful, for his antecedents were wholly unknown, but in his time he could hardly have been in any household where he would not have heard Uncle Tom's Cabin talked about. When he came to Mrs. Stowe, he was as large as he ever was, and apparently as old as he ever became. Yet there was in him no appearance of age. He was in the happy maturity of all his powers, and you would rather have said that in that maturity he had found the secret of perpetual youth, and it was as difficult to believe that he would ever be aged as it was to imagine that he had ever been in immature youth. There was in him a mysterious perpetuity. After some years, when Mrs. Stowe made her winter home in Florida, Calvin came to live with us. From the first moment, he fell into the ways of the house and assumed a recognized position in the family. I say recognized, because after he became known, he was always inquired for by visitors and in the letters to the other members of the family he always received a message. Although the least obtrusive of beings, his individuality always made itself felt. His personal appearance had much to do with this, for he was of royal mould, and had an air of high breeding. He was large, but he had nothing of the fat grossness of the celebrated Angora family. Though powerful, he was exquisitely proportioned, and as graceful in every movement as a young leopard. When he stood up to open a door, he opened all the doors with old-fashioned latches. He was portentously tall, and when stretched on the rug before the fire, he seemed too long for this world, as indeed he was. His coat was the finest and softest, I have ever seen a shade of quiet Maltese, and from his throat downward, underneath to the white tips of his feet, he wore the whitest and most delicate ermine, and no person was ever more fastidiously neat. In his finely formed head you saw something of his aristocratic character. The ears were small and cleanly cut. There was a tinge of pink in the nostrils, his face was handsome, and the expression of his countenance exceedingly intelligent. I should call it even a sweet expression. 
if the term were not inconsistent with his look of alertness and sagacity. It is difficult to convey a just idea of his gaiety in connection with his dignity and gravity which his name expressed. As we know nothing of his family, of course it will be understood that Calvin was his Christian name. He had times of relaxation into utter playfulness, delighting in a ball of yarn, catching sportively at stray ribbons when his mistress was at her toilet, and pursuing his own tail with hilarity for lack of anything better. He could amuse himself by the hour, and he did not care for children. Perhaps something in his past was present to his memory. He had absolutely no bad habits, and his disposition was perfect. I never saw him exactly angry, though I have seen his tail grow to an enormous size when a strange cat appeared upon his lawn. He disliked cats, evidently regarding them as feline and treacherous, and he had no association with them. Occasionally there would be heard a night concert in the shrubbery. Calvin would ask to have the door opened, and then you would hear a rush and a psst, and the concert would explode, and Calvin would come quietly in and resume his seat on the hearth. There was no trace of anger in his manner, but he wouldn't have any of that about the house. He had the rare virtue of magnanimity. Although he had fixed notions about his own rights and extraordinary persistence in getting them, he never showed temper at a repulse. He simply and firmly persisted till he had what he wanted. His diet was one point. His idea was that of the scholars about dictionaries to get the best. He knew as well as anyone what was in the house and would refuse beef if turkey was to be had and if there were oysters he would wait over the turkey to see if the oysters would not be forthcoming. And yet he was not a gross gourmand. He would eat bread if he saw me eating it, and thought he was not being imposed on. His habits of feeding also were refined. He never used a knife, and he would put up his hand and draw the fork down to his mouth as gracefully as a grown person. Unless necessity compelled, he would not eat in the kitchen, but insisted upon his meals in the dining-room, and would wait patiently unless a stranger were present, and then he was sure to importune the visitor, hoping that the latter was ignorant of the rule of the house and would give him something. They used to say that he preferred, as his tablecloth on the floor, a certain well-known church journal but this was said by an Episcopalian. So far as I know, he had no religious prejudices, except that he did not like the association with Romanists. He tolerated the servants because they belonged to the house, and would sometimes linger by the kitchen stove. But the moment visitors came in, he arose, opened the door, and marched into the drawing-room. Yet he enjoyed the company of his equals, and never withdrew, no matter how many callers whom he recognized as of his society might come into the drawing-room. Calvin was fond of company, but he wanted to choose it, and I have no doubt that his was an aristocratic fastidiousness rather than one of faith. It is so with most people. The intelligence of Calvin was something phenomenal in his rank of life. He established a method of communicating his wants, and even some of his sentiments, and he could help himself in many things. There was a furnace register in a retired room where he used to go when he wished to be alone, that he always opened when he desired more heat, but never shut it, any more than he shut the door after himself. He could do almost everything but speak and you would declare sometimes that you could see a pathetic longing to do that in his intelligent face. I have no desire to overdraw his qualities, but if there was one thing in him more noticeable than another, it was his fondness for nature. He could content himself for hours at the low window, looking into the ravine and at the great trees, noting the smallest stir there. 
he delighted above all things to accompany me walking about the garden hearing the birds getting the smell of the fresh earth and rejoicing in the sunshine he followed me and gambled like a dog rolling over on the turf and exhibiting his delight in a hundred ways if i worked he sat and watched me or looked off over the bank and kept his ear open to the twitter in the cherry trees when it stormed he was sure to sit at the window keenly watching the rain or the snow glancing up and down at its falling and a winter tempest always delighted him i think he was genuinely fond of birds but so far as i know he usually confined himself to one a day he never killed as some sportsmen do for the sake of killing but only as civilized people do from necessity he was intimate with the flying squirrels who dwell in the chestnut trees too intimate for almost every day in the summer he would bring in one until he nearly discouraged them he was indeed a superb hunter and would have been a devastating one if his bump of destructiveness had not been offset by a bump of moderation there was very little of the brutality of the lower animals about him i don't think he enjoyed rats for themselves but he knew his business and for the first few months of his residence with us he waged an awful campaign against the horde and after that his simple presence was sufficient to deter them from coming on the premises mice amused him but he usually considered them too small game to be taken seriously i have seen him play for an hour with a mouse and then let him go with a royal condescension in this whole matter of getting a living calvin was a great contrast to the rapacity of the age in which he lived i hesitate a little to speak of his capacity for friendship and the affectionateness of his nature for i know from his own reserve that he would not care to have it much talked about we understood each other perfectly but we never made any fuss about it when i spoke his name and snapped my fingers he came to me when i returned home at night he was pretty sure to be waiting for me near the gate and would rise and saunter along the walk as if his being there was purely accidental so shy was he commonly of showing feeling and when i opened the door he never rushed in like a cat but loitered and lounged as if he had had no intention of going in but would condescend to and yet the fact was he knew dinner was ready and he was bound to be there he kept the run of dinner time it happened sometimes during our absence in the summer that dinner would be early and calvin walking about the grounds missed it and came in late but he never made a mistake the second day there was one thing he never did he never rushed through an open doorway he never forgot his dignity if he had asked to have the door opened and was eager to go out he always went deliberately i can see him now standing on the sill looking about at the sky as if he was thinking whether it were worth while to take an umbrella until he was near having his tail shut in his friendship was rather constant than demonstrative when we returned from an absence of nearly two years calvin welcomed us with evident pleasure but showed his satisfaction rather by tranquil happiness than by fuming about he had the faculty of making us glad to get home it was his constancy that was so attractive he liked companionship but he wouldn't be petted or fussed over or sit in any one's lap a moment he always extricated himself from such familiarity with dignity and with no show of temper if there was any petting to be done however he chose to do it often he would sit looking at me and then moved by a delicate affection come and pull at my coat and sleeve until he could touch my face with his nose and then go away contented he had a habit of coming to my study in the morning sitting quietly by my side or on the table for hours watching the pen run over the paper occasionally swinging his tail round 
or a blotter, and then going to sleep among the papers by the inkstand, or more rarely he would watch the writing from a perch on my shoulder. Writing always interested him, and until he understood it, he wanted to hold the pen. End of section 11